In this video, I'll give you an introduction to Python game development by walking you through creating a simple, fun, yet extensible game. We'll make this game using the Pygame module, which is a simple 2D graphics library in Python that allows you to create a variety of games. In case you're curious, I have tons of different Pygame tutorials on this channel, and a recent one I posted actually shows you how to build an entire platformer game. Here we'll make something much more simple just to get through the basics and get you up and started as fast as possible. Let me show you a demo of what we're going to build. So on the screen here, you can see our game. Again, this is fairly straightforward. We have a background. We have a rectangle that you could change to some kind of sprite or character if you wanted to. And then we have projectiles that are falling on the screen. As we progress further, these projectiles will get faster and more of them will fall. And eventually, if we are to collide with one of these rectangles, then it will tell us that we lost. Obviously, you could go and add lives, you can make different levels, you can make this game really completely your own, but I wanted to show you the basics covering things like movement, collisions, projectiles, backgrounds, and all of that kind of fundamental stuff that once you know, you can make a ton of different games with. So with that said, let's get into the video. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that if you are interested in becoming a software engineer or learning more about Python, Go, and other programming topics, I do have a course called programmingexpert.io. I'll leave a link to that in the description. I also just released a blockchain course, so anybody interested in Web3, blockchain technology, creating smart contracts, Solidity, etc., you can check out my course Blockchain Expert again from the link in the description. So the first thing we need to do when we're going to be working with this Pygame module is we need to install Pygame. Now to do that, you're going to open up a command prompt or a terminal and type the following command, which is pip install pygame. Now, for some reason, this command does not work for you. You can try to run the command pip3 install pygame. And if neither of those work for you, I will leave two videos in the description and I'll kind of throw the thumbnails up on the screen that explain to you how to install pygame. All right, so now that Pygame is installed, we can start using this library. Now I've used this a ton of times, but I'm going to walk you through step by step how we set everything up. So the first thing to do is go into a new Python file. You can see I'm in one here in VS Code. You can work in any editor that you like and import the Pygame module. Now, while we're up here, we're going to import a few other modules we're going to use for this game. So we're going to import time and we are going to import random like that. Perfect. All right. Next thing we're going to do here is set up our Pygame window. Now, the first thing you need whenever you're working in Pygame is some kind of window. This is really the place where you can draw different objects and actually have your game running. Now, for your window, you need a width and a height. So I like to define my width and height at the top of my program in all capitals, just so that it's clear that these are constant values and they're not going to change. So for the width, I'm going to make this 1000. And for the height, I'm going to make this 800. And that is in pixels. Now, if you are working on a small display, chances are this will be too large for you. So you can make these values smaller so that the window will actually fit on your screen. OK, now that we have the width and the height, we're going to say win standing for our window is equal to pygame dot display dot set underscore mode. And inside of here, we're going to pass a tuple with the width and the height. Make sure you have two sets of parentheses here and inside of this inner set, you have your width and then your height and make sure you spell the width correctly. OK, the next thing we can do is set a caption for our window. This is going to be the name at the top of the window. To do that, we can say pygame dot display dot set underscore caption. And then we're going to pass a string here and I'll just call this something like space dodge. But you can call this whatever you want. All right, before we go any further, let's run our code here. So I'm going to go and type Python and then main.py, whatever editor you're working in. I assume you know how to run your Python script in VS Code. You can also press this button. OK, so when I do that, you'll notice that a window kind of popped up and then it disappeared immediately. That's because we don't have any loop kind of running that keeps our program alive. But you can see again when I run this window pops up and then it closes in a minute. We'll make sure that window stays alive uh, and I'll show you how to do that. Perfect. So now that we have our uh, window here, our width and our height, we need to set up what's known as the main game loop. Now, whenever you're working in Pygame, you need a loop, typically a while loop that is going to run while the game runs, right? So that actually keeps it alive. The while loop will do things like check for collision, check for movements or key presses, and then adjust what's being displayed on the screen. So what we're going to do is create a function called main. This is really where the main game logic is going to exist. For now, we're going to create a variable called run. And we're going to say this is equal to true. And we're going to say while run and then inside of here is going to be our main game loop. So the first thing that I always do inside of my game loop is I check to see if the user pressed the X button on the window. If they did that, then I want to close the window. 
It's not automatically programmed in. You need to handle that key press yourself. So to do that, I'm going to say for event in pygame dot event dot get. And this is essentially a list that contains all of the different events that have occurred in the last, um, what do you call it, kind of iteration of this loop. Then what we do is check for the X button event. So we're going to say if event dot type is equal to pygame dot and then in all capitals quit, what we are going to do is say run is equal to false, which will then end this while loop. And we are going to break out of the for loop because there's no reason to continue checking the events if you've hit the quit button. Then at the very end of our function here, we're going to say pygame dot quit and pygame dot quit will just close the pygame window for us. All right. So very quick recap of what we've done here. We've said run is equal to true. While the variable run is equal to true, we're going to check all of the different events that are occurring. This again will give us events like key presses, mouse being moved, uh, all that kind of stuff, as well as if we hit the button in the top right hand corner, that X button, which is the event dot type equal to pygame dot quit. That's if that's the case, sorry, we're going to say run equals to false. We're going to break out of this for loop and then that will force us to have this statement here, which will quit the pie game window. Now what we need to do is call this main function so we can test this out. We're going to say if underscore underscore name is equal to underscore underscore main like that, then we are going to call the main function. Now, what this statement is doing right here is making sure that we are directly running this Python file. So we're running the file itself. We're not importing it because if we were to import it or if we were to not have this line, for example, and we were to import this file from another Python file, it would start running our game when we only want to do that if we directly run this Python file. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. But this is just checking if you've run this file directly, whereas if you were to import it, this is going to be false. OK, so now let's run our code. Python main.py. Notice the window appears and it has space dodge as the caption. Then if I press this X button, we can close out of it. That only works because of the code that we've written here. Fantastic. So the next thing I want to do is have a background image and then I want to have a character that can move around on the screen. So let's start with the background image. Well, for our background image, we need some image that we're going to display on the screen. Now notice here that I actually have one BG dot JPEG. Now, this is a largish image, uh, which is just a space background. All of this code will be available from my GitHub, including the image. So if you want to download this exact image, you can do that by going to the link in the description. If you don't want this image and you just want your own background image, then just save an image. You can call it whatever you want, but put it in the same directory as your Python script. And then I'll show you how we can use that image as a background. So at the top of our program here, we're going to say BG standing for background is equal to pi game dot image dot load and then we are going to load the name of our file which in my case is bg dot jpeg like that that's all you need to do to actually load this image uh, into pi game now if you named your something else obviously you're going to change the name to match that and if you had it for example inside of a directory then you would do something like slash images slash and then bg dot jpeg there's a few other ways to go about doing that but in this case we're just going to load directly from the same directory that this python script is in OK, now that we have our background image, we actually need to put that on the screen. Now, I like to do all of my drawing in a separate function just to keep it very clear and kind of organized. So I'm going to create a function here called draw inside of this function. For now, I'm going to draw this background image onto the screen. To do that, we're going to use our window, which is this capital win variable. And we're going to say win dot blit. Now, blit is a special method that you use when you want to draw an image or a surface. That's what's referred to in Python onto the screen. So we are going to blit the background image and then we need to pass the coordinates of the top left hand corner of this image. So in Pygame, when we're talking about our coordinate system, zero zero is the top left hand corner of the screen. So if I run my code here, uh, this should still be OK. Oops, that's not working. Let's do this. You can see that where my mouse is, this is zero zero. If I go all the way over to the right here, now we are at whatever the width of the screen is, which is a thousand and then the Y coordinate of zero. If I were to go down here, now we are at the width of the screen, which is a thousand and then the height of 800 or the height of whatever our screen is, because that's kind of how the Y is incremented. So rather than Y going up, the Y actually goes down. Zero is the top. And as you go down to the bottom, you increase your Y value. X is the same as normal. Starts at zero. And as you go to the right, it increases. Meaning down here, we have an X of zero and we have a Y of the height of the screen. OK, 
So that's the coordinate system. Now I want my background image to fill the entire screen. So I'm going to put 0, 0 as the coordinate of where the top left hand corner of this background image should be placed. Then the width and the height will fill the screen. Lastly, we need to say pygame dot display dot update. This is going to refresh the display, which means any draws that we've done, this is a drawing event, will actually be applied and put onto the screen. So every time you update, it takes all of the draws and applies it. If you don't have an update, then nothing's going to happen on the screen. Fantastic. So now before we exit our while loop here, we're going to call this draw function. So now every single frame, we're going to call the draw function and it's going to continue to draw this on the screen. Let's go ahead and run our code. OK, so when we run it, you can see that we get our space image appearing. Now, in my case, my space image is quite large, so it actually fills the entire screen. For some of you, your image might be a little bit smaller and you might want to scale it up or make it larger so that it fills the screen. Now, to scale your image, you can do the following. You can write pygame dot transform, if we can spell that correctly, dot scale. And then you can pass the image, which in this case is the image that we want to load. And then the size that you want to scale this image to. So in my case, I want to scale my image to be width height. So it's going to be this. Now, when you do this type of scaling, it is not going to preserve the aspect ratio, but there is different transform functions that allow you to look up from the documentation that let you actually scale it um, based on a factor. So you can scale by 2x, 3x, 4x, etc., rather than scaling using kind of this, uh, what do you call it, width height system. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but this will not preserve your aspect ratio. If you use a different scale function, it will. There's one that I believe is scale 2x, which just takes the image and scales it up two times the size. OK, so now this should scale our image to be the width and the height. Let's quickly test this out. And let me just select this interpreter so this will keep working now. So now you can see our image looks a little bit better. We've kind of uh, made it the exact size of our screen rather than having it be too large and overflow the screen. OK, so now we have our background image and we have our main event loop. We have kind of the screen appearing. The next thing we want to do is create a character that can move around. So let's do that. So for our character, we're going to go inside of our main loop here and we're going to say player is equal to a pi game dot rectangle with a capital R. And this is just going to be rect. And then we're going to pass the X position, Y position, width and height of our player. So before I go here, I'm going to create two variables, one which is the player width, which will make equal to 40, and another which is the player height, which will be equal to 60. I like to declare all of my constant variables in capitals at the top of my program so I can easily change them and update all of my code by just changing one variable here. So now I'm going to go to my player, which is pygame.rectangle, and we're going to pick a starting X and a starting Y position for our character. Now, remember that this is going to be the top left hand corner of where we are drawing the player. So we can pick any X coordinate we want. I'm going to pick 200. And then for the Y coordinate, we want this player to be at the bottom of the screen. So to do this dynamically, we're going to take the height of the screen and we're going to subtract the height of the player. So we take height minus player height. That gives us the top left hand corner where we draw this player. So that means that since our height is 800, and our player height is 60. We're going to draw this at 740, meaning the bottom of the player will be directly at the bottom of the screen. You'll see what I mean when we draw this, but that's why I'm using this math here. Next, we're going to pass the player width and the player height. So it goes X, Y, width, height, whenever you're using a rectangle in Pygame. OK, so now that we have our player, we want to draw this player onto the screen. So I'm going to pass this player rectangle to my draw function and then I'm going to go to draw and I'm going to accept my player rectangle. Now I'm going to draw it to draw my rectangle. I'm going to say pygame dot draw dot rect. And then the first thing I'm going to pass is where I want to draw a rectangle. Well, I want to draw a rectangle on my window. So I pass window. The next thing I pass is the color that I want my rectangle to be. In this case, I'm going to use red. Now, in the newest version of Pygame, which most of you will be using, you can just use string uh, colors. So red, white, black, orange, any color you would know, or you can use RGB. So if I use RGB, then that would be something like 255, 0, 0, where I have 255 red, uh, 0 blue, and 0 green. RGB, I think I read it in the, in the wrong order. Red, green, blue. Yeah, sorry. So 0 green and 0 blue. 
but you get the idea. You can use an RGB color code or for simplicity, you can just write the color in, which in this case is red. OK, next we are going to put the rectangle that we want to draw, and that rectangle is our player. So our player is a pie game rectangle, which is an accepted argument to this method here. So we say we're drawing it on the window. It's a red rectangle, and this is actually the coordinates of the rectangle, right? So it's at 200, it's at this height, and it has this width and this height. Perfect. Now that we have that, we should see a red rectangle appearing when we run our code. There you go. We have our rectangle showing up on the screen. Fantastic. Now that we have our rectangle, we want to move it around. Now to move the rectangle is as easy as adjusting the X coordinate of this rectangle. So let's have a look at how we do that. The first thing we need to do is listen for different key presses. So if the user presses the left arrow key, I want to move to the left, which would be reducing its X value. If they press the right arrow key, I want to move to the right. So I'm going to say keys is equal to pygame dot key dot get underscore press. Now, this will give you a list of all of the keys that the user has pressed and tell you, well, if they press them or not. So what I can do here is say the following. I can say if keys and sorry, I said list, I mean dictionary. And then I can say pygame dot K underscore left which is the code for the left arrow key. If that's the case, then I can take my player dot X and I can subtract from that the player velocity, which is a variable that we're going to define now at the top of our program. So we're going to say player what player bell sorry is equal to five. Let me just move this down. OK, so we're saying if keys pi game dot K underscore left, you may be wondering how I found this. I just know it because I've used it many, many times before, but this is the uh, kind of what do you call it? It's code for the left arrow key. If you wanted, for example, the A key, then it would be K underscore A or K underscore B or C, etc. If you wanted like the shift key, it's K underscore shift. There's a whole um, kind of documentation where you can look up all of the key codes from the Pi Game website. You can also just look up Pi Game key codes and you'll probably find a big list that tells you. But the common ones are going to be like space, shift, C, A, W, etc. or left, right so on. OK, so if they are pressing the left arrow key, then we're going to subtract the Y. The reason we subtract, sorry, not the Y, the X is because we want to move them left. So by subtracting their X coordinate, we move them closer to the zero zero position. So to the left, that's why we're doing this subtraction. Now we have the player velocity set at five, which means every time that you press this key, we're going to go five pixels backwards. You can adjust that velocity if you want the character to move faster or slower. Now, of course, we're going to do the same thing for the other arrow key. So pi game dot K underscore right. And then we say if I can get rid of that crazy autocomplete player dot X plus equals the player velocity. One thing to note here when I use dot X, that's simply adjusting the first value here. So we start at 200, then we go back by the velocity or forward by the velocity, right? That's how you access that. You can also access the width property and the Y property as well as the height property, and that corresponds with the values up here. OK, fantastic. So now we should be able to move our player because we have this movement code. So let's run and see if we can do that. And using my arrow keys, you can see that I can move my player. However, it's moving extremely fast. Now, the reason for this is that we haven't set up a clock or kind of a timer that regulates how fast our Pi game loop is running. Now, for some of you, if you're on a slower computer, you're going to run that and be like, oh, the speed is fine. It works OK. The issue is that the speed that this while loop runs at is what determines how quickly our character is moving. If I'm holding down the key and this while loop is running really, really fast, I'm going to move fast. If it's running very slow, say you're on a slow computer, then this is going to move slow. We don't want that. We want this loop to always run at the exact same speed so that no matter what computer you're on, it's going to run at the same pace and your character is always going to move at the same speed. To do that, we need to set up a clock object. So we're going to say clock is equal to pi game dot time dot capital C clock. Then we're going to go here and we're going to say clock dot tick and then we're going to put 60, which is the maximum number of frames per second or number of times that you want, want this while loop to be running. So you create a clock object here and then inside of your while loop, you have clock dot tick. This is essentially going to delay the while loop such that it will only run a maximum of 60 times per second. If you wanted it to run faster, obviously you would adjust this value to be whatever the fixed FPS value is that you would like. OK, 
Now that we have clock.tick, you'll notice that when I run my code, my character now moves a lot slower. So again, you could speed this up by increasing the velocity, and then no matter what computer you're on, it's going to be moving at a similar or the exact same speed. Okay, so we're moving, but notice here that I can actually move completely off the screen. We obviously don't want that for our game, otherwise you can just dodge by going off the screen. So we need to make it so you can't move if you're hitting the edges of the screen. To do that, we just need to come here to our conditions where we're checking if you're pressing the left arrow key and right arrow key and add a guard clause uh, that makes it such that you cannot move if you're going to be moving off the screen. So the way we do this is we add another condition here with and we say if keys pygame.k underscore left and we have the player dot y minus the player underscore velocity is greater than or equal to zero. Now, the reason we're putting this here is we're saying, OK, we're about to subtract the player velocity from the X coordinate. So if when we subtract this, the player is still uh, above zero or greater than zero, so their X coordinate is greater than zero, then that's OK. We can subtract this. But if it's not, so if we're going to be like negative one, negative two, negative three, et cetera, don't let them move. Hopefully that's clear why we're doing that. But that's why we have this code here. Now, let's copy this and put the same thing here. Except now we need to change this a little bit because we're adding to the velocity or we're adding to the X coordinate. Sorry. So we have player dot X apologies plus player dot val. And then we're going to say plus player dot width. And this is actually going to be less than or equal to the width of the screen. Now, this one is a little bit longer because we have to account for the fact that player dot X is the top left hand corner of our player. So we need to add the velocity kind of like we did here, but in the opposite direction because we're increasing it, not decreasing it. And we also need to account for the width. Again, this is the top left hand corner. Then we have a width of, in this case, 40 pixels. So we need to make sure the X coordinate plus the width plus the velocity is going to be less than the width of the screen before we allow the character to move to the right. OK, now let's run this and see if it works. And notice when I go to the right here, I can't move any further than the very edge of the screen and same with the left hand side. OK, we now have a character that is moving around. The next thing we need to do is keep track of the amount of time that has elapsed. We then need to create some projectiles that are coming down on the screen and then check for collision with those projectiles. Currently, we're about halfway done. If you're still following along at this point, congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. Believe it or not, most people do not make it this far. All right, so there's a few different kind of directions we can go in here in terms of what we want to write next, but I think the easiest is going to be to handle the time so we know how much time has elapsed. To do that, we are going to create a variable here called start time. Start time is going to be equal to time dot time. Time dot time is going to give us the current time. So we're going to grab the current time when the game started, and then we're going to create another variable here called elapsed underscore time and make this equal to zero. Then beneath our clock dot tick, we're going to say elapsed underscore time. And this is going to be equal to time dot time minus the start time. So we're essentially storing what time we started the while loop at. Then every time we iterate, we're getting what the current time is and subtracting that from the start time, which will give us the number of seconds that have elapsed since we started the while loop or since we started the game. Now that we have the elapsed time, we can pass that to our draw function and we can draw the elapsed time on the screen. So we're going to go to our draw function. We're going to take elapsed underscore time as another parameter here. And then we're going to draw this. Now to draw this, we actually need to use a font because we're going to have text on the screen that says time, you know, two seconds, three seconds, etc. So what we need to do is initialize our font module, create a font object, and then use that font to render some text on the screen. So at the top of our code, we're going to say pygame dot font dot init. We just need to initialize the font module. Don't ask me why we need to do this. It's a requirement from pygame. So we just do that at the top of our program. Then we're going to come down here and we're going to say font is equal to pygame dot font dot S Y S font with this capitalization. And then we can pass any of our system fonts. In this case, I like to use Comic Sans and the size of our font which I will choose as 30. You can change this to be whatever you want. There's different types of fonts you can put in here. You know, Times New Roman, Arial, uh, etc. And then whatever the size is, I'm just going to make it 30. 
So again, the procedure is initialize the font module, create a font object here, and then use the font object to create some text which you can render on the screen. So to do that, I'm going to say my time underscore text inside of my draw function is equal to font dot render. And then I'm going to pass the text I want to render. Now, in this case, I'm going to say time colon. And then inside of my F string here, I'm going to say round. And then elapsed underscore time. And then I'm going to put an S here. Then I'm going to put a one and I'm going to put the color, which is white. Don't worry, I'll go through this slower. I know that was pretty fast. So we have render. The first thing we do is pass the string or the text that we want to render on the screen. Now I'm using an F string available in Python 3.7 and above, and this allows me to embed a variable directly inside of the string and have it rendered as a string. So I'm saying time colon, and then I am rounding the elapsed time to the nearest second. And I put this inside of my curly braces so that I can directly use this variable in this round function. Then I put an S so that I have, you know, three, four, five, whatever seconds. Next, I put one. One stands for anti-aliasing. Don't worry about this too much, but it just looks makes your text look a little bit better. And then you pass the color that you want this text to be. In this case, I want white. OK, now that we have our text, we need to render this on the screen. So we're going to say win dot blit. And then we're going to blit the time underscore text. And the position we're going to blit it at is 10, 10. So just so we have a little bit of padding from the top left hand corner of the screen. 10 pixels X, 10 pixels Y just moves us a little bit off the edge of the screen. So it looks a little bit better. All right. Now we should be rendering the uh, time. So let's see if that works by running our code and notice that we have our time. It is counting up uh, and it will keep displaying whatever the current time is. Awesome. So now that we have our time, the next thing we need to do is generate some projectiles. Now we're going to generate our projectiles on kind of a counting increment where the increment at which we generate them gets shorter and shorter, meaning we kind of generate more of them uh, more quickly as the time progresses, making the game a little bit more difficult. Obviously, you can mess with this mechanic however you'd like, but I wanted to show you how we do some kind of dynamic rendering here so we're not just putting one on the screen, say, every one second. It gets a little bit more complicated than that. All right. So to do this, we need to have a few variables. We're going to say star. I'm going to call those little projectiles stars, even though I know they don't really look like them. I'm going to say star add increment is equal to 2000 milliseconds, which means the first star that we add will be added in 2000 milliseconds. Then we are going to have star underscore count equal to zero. And this is actually just going to be a variable that tells us when we should add the next star. I know it's a little bit misleading. It's not telling us how many stars we have. It's going to be counting so that we know when we get to this increment and when we should add another star to the screen. OK, then we're going to have an array here called stars or a list. Sorry. And this is where we're going to store all of our different stars that are currently on the screen. Then we'll draw all of them that are inside of this list onto the screen. OK, so at the top of our code here, although it doesn't really matter where you put this, we're going to generate some of our stars. So we're going to actually say that our star underscore count plus equals clock dot tick. Now, I know this seems a little bit weird, but what clock dot tick does is return the number of milliseconds since the last clock tick. So you need to actually do it in this way to keep track of the time accurately. In my case, it's about 16 or 17 milliseconds between every clock tick. But for you, it could be slightly different. So we say star count plus equals clock dot tick. And what this is doing is essentially counting how many milliseconds have occurred since, again, the last clock tick. You could use this elapsed time variable, but it gets a little bit more complicated based on how we're kind of keeping track of the time with this variable. I know that I'm probably confusing you a little bit. Again, this is just returning number of milliseconds since last tick. So you do that um, to keep track of kind of the precise time in this variable. All right. Now we're going to say if the star count is greater than the star add increment, then we're going to add stars to the screen. So hopefully you see what I'm doing here. This is 2000. The star count is zero. As soon as we have 2000 milliseconds that have elapsed, then we trigger this and then we add a star. Now, I'm actually going to add three stars at a time, but you could add a random number. You could add 20 stars. You could add one star. You can add as many as you want to the screen. So I'm going to say four underscore in range three because I want to add three stars. 
And by the way, this is a placeholder variable that you use when you don't want to have an increment variable like I. I don't actually care about the iteration count. I just want to do something three times. So I say four underscore in range three. OK, now I'm going to generate the X position of my star because I want to randomly position them on the screen. So I'm going to pick a valid X coordinate and then we'll choose a Y coordinate and place the star on the screen. So star X is equal to random dot rand int and then zero width minus the star underscore width, which is a variable that I don't believe we've defined yet. So let's add that variable to the top of our screen here and make that equal to let's go with 10. OK, so again, star underscore X is equal to random dot rand int zero width minus star width. Now, the reason we're doing this is because we want to pick a random integer in the range of zero and width again, minus the star width, which is a valid position for the X coordinate of the star that we are generating. OK, we can do this because we imported the random module at the top of our program. We're then going to say star is equal to pi game dot rect. And we're going to place this at the star underscore X and at the negative star underscore height, which is another variable that we need to define. So let's go here and make this equal to 20. OK, now the reason I'm doing this is I want my star to start off of the screen and then move down. So when I do negative star height, that means I'm going to get a negative Y coordinate. So my star starts not at the top of the screen, a little bit above the top of the screen. And then as we move it down, it looks like it enters the screen. If instead you were to put zero here, then you would see the star kind of appear right at the top of the screen and then start moving down. Instead, we want to see it slowly enter the screen. So we do that by giving it a negative height to start. OK, next we pass the star width and the star underscore height. And now we add this star to our stars list. So we say stars dot append star like that. OK, so this now generates three random stars for us. Now that we have that, we want to adjust our star add increment and we want to set our star count back to zero. So we say star count equal to zero. And before that, we're going to adjust this increment so that it's slightly less than what it currently is so that we generate stars faster. To do that, we say star add increment is equal to the maximum of 200 and the star add increment minus 50. OK, so let's just quickly go through what I did here. I'm essentially saying with this maximum function, pick the maximum value out of this and 200. Now, this makes it so that the minimum star add increment I ever have is 200, right? So if star add increment is equal to 200, Rather than setting it equal to 150, then 50, then zero, then negative 50, we always keep it at 200. OK, so this is just the minimum value. That's what I'm setting here. Then in most cases, what will happen is since star at increment is going to be much larger than 200 in the starting case equal to 2000, we're going to subtract 50 milliseconds so that every time that this runs 50 milliseconds kind of faster, we generate another star. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, but we go from 2000 to 1950 to 1900, etc., and it gets faster and faster and faster the time in which we're incrementing a star. And you can obviously adjust this and change it to be whatever you want. OK, so that will generate our stars for us. However, if we want to see our stars, then we actually need to draw them on the screen and we need to move them downwards. So we're going to do both of those steps before, unfortunately, we can see what's going to happen here. So now after we generate our stars, after we do our events and after we do our movements, we're going to move our stars. So we're going to say four star in stars. And then we're actually going to make a copy of this stars list. The reason I'm making a copy of the stars list is that I'm going to be removing stars from this list that have hit the bottom of the screen or that have hit our player. If that happens, if they hit our player, hit the bottom of the screen, we want to get rid of them because we don't want to be rendering them and uh, moving them when they're not on the screen. That's a waste of resources. So I need to make a copy of this list because if I'm modifying the list while I'm working on it, I can get all kinds of weird errors. So rather than doing that, I make a copy of it so that I'm looping through the copy and then I can adjust or mutate the original list as I go through this for loop. So I'm going to say star dot y plus equal the star velocity. 
Okay, so this moves the star downwards uh, in the y direction by this velocity because we're adding to it, meaning it goes down. Then I'm going to say if the star dot y is greater than the height of the screen, then what I want to do is remove this star. So I'm going to say stars dot remove. And then I remove the star, which will remove the first instance of this or really the only instance of it from the original stars list. Nice. Next, we're going to say L if star dot y is greater than or equal to the player dot y and the star dot collide rect player. Then we are going to remove the star again. So stars dot remove star. And we're going to say hit is equal to true. And we're going to break out of this loop. OK, you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute. But essentially what we're doing with the second elif statement here is we're saying, OK, if the star dot y was not greater than the height, then we're going to check if the star dot y is greater than or equal to the player dot y. Now, the reason we're doing this check here is because I only want to check to see if this star is colliding with the player if the star is at the bottom portion of the screen. So if it's in the same Y kind of plane as our player, if it's not, there's no point in me checking uh, if the star has collided with the player, right? That just doesn't make any sense because if it's way above the player, I don't need to check for collision because I know it can't be colliding. And in fact, I need to add something here. Star dot Y plus star dot height, because again, we need to account for the fact that the star has a height, uh, not just a Y coordinate. OK, so we say star dot Y plus star dot height. If that is greater than or equal to the player dot Y, then we're going to check if the star has collided with the player. So since both of these are pi game rectangle objects, that allows us to use this fancy function called collide rect, which just tells us if two rectangles have collided. So if they've collided, then I want to remove this star because it hit our player. And I'm going to set a variable hit equal to true because we'll then look at that variable later on to see if our player has been hit by a star. OK, now we just want to go up here and say hit is equal to false, just so that if we do end up checking this variable later on, we don't get an error where it's undefined. OK, so I know I've done a lot there, but we started by generating all of our stars. We then moved all of the stars now we need to draw all of the stars. So I'm going to pass my stars to this draw function. I'm going to go to my draw function and I'm going to start drawing them. Now it doesn't really matter where you draw them, but if you draw them after the player, they'll appear on top of them. If you draw them before the player, they'll appear behind the player. So pick where you want to draw them. I'm going to do it after so you can see it on top of the player. OK, so fairly straightforward here. We're going to say four star in stars high game dot draw dot rectangle on the window with the color white R star. OK, straightforward. Same as our player. We're just doing it for every single star. All right. So that's going to be a majority of the game done. Let's run it. Make sure it works. And then we'll handle showing something on the screen when the player gets hit by a star. OK, so let's run. And you should see that we get some stuff appearing on the screen, but it looks like we got an error. So what is our error here? It actually didn't show up for me. So let me run this one more time and we'll wait for the error message. And it says star velocity is not defined. OK, so that's a variable that we need to define. So let's say star vel is equal to three. Again, feel free to adjust that to be whatever you want. OK, now let's try it and see if our stars start moving. And there you go. Three stars are generated and they start moving on the screen. Perfect. And notice that they kind of disappear when they hit the player or when they hit the bottom of the screen. OK, fantastic. So now the last thing we need to do is just put something on the screen that says, hey, you collided with a star, you lost the game, and that will be finished. OK, great. So to do that, we're going to go down to the bottom of our while loop here. And before our draw statement, we're going to check if the player was hit by a star. So we're going to say if hit, then we're going to do something. Now, really, all we're going to do is just generate some text that says you lost, put it on the screen, kind of delay for a few seconds, and that'll be it. And if you want to adjust this game and kind of make it longer, add levels, you can do that from here. So we're going to say lost underscore text is equal to our font dot render. You can make a different font if you want. I'm just going to use the same one. I'm going to say you lost exclamation point and then one and then the color of white. OK, now I'm going to draw this on the screen. So I'm going to say win dot bullet the lost underscore text and I'm going to draw this in the center of the screen. 
to draw this in the center of the screen, we do the following. We say width divided by two minus the lost underscore text dot get underscore width, which is a uh, method you can use to get the width of your text object divided by two. And then we do the same for the height. So we say height divided by two minus lost underscore text dot get underscore height divided by two. Okay, so let me just quickly explain why we're doing this. We want this in the middle of the screen, but we need to pick the top left hand position of the text that puts it in the middle of the screen. So you might naively think that you can just do width over two because that's the middle position of the screen, but you can't. You actually have to get the full width of the text object and then divide that by two and subtract that from width over two. Right. So if we have, um, can I kind of run this? Let's run this and see. So let's say 500 is where my mouse is, right? If I draw my text, it's going to go this direction from my mouse. So I need to shift it back half the width of the text and then draw it so that it fills the screen completely in the middle. And then obviously the same goes for the height. OK, hopefully that's clear. Uh, that's why we're doing that. All right. So now that we've blit this on the screen, we need to update the screen. So pygame dot display dot update. Then we are simply going to pause. So we're going to say pygame dot time dot delay. I'm going to delay for 4000 milliseconds, which is four seconds. And then I'm going to break, which will break this while loop and will end the game. OK, so let me quickly run through. We generate the text. We draw it onto the screen. Now, since I'm not doing this in the draw function, I need to manually update the display. So we actually see that appearing. Then we just freeze the game. So this is just delaying everything for four seconds, just so you can see the text. And then we break and the game ends. If you wanted to, you could call the main function again, or you could have the game run a second time. You can do whatever you want here. You could say how long you've lasted, whatever you can add a scoreboard, but this is where I'm going to leave it for now. So let's just run, make sure this is working. And then that's pretty much going to wrap up this tutorial. Okay. So let's just see if we can collide here and we do. And notice it says you lost and then the game is going to end and we can run it again. OK, fantastic. So let me zoom out a bit here so you guys can read some more of the code. I'll kind of scroll through it slowly. Obviously, all of this code will be available from the link in the description at my GitHub. But that was an introduction to Python game development. I hope that this was complicated enough that it taught you some stuff and showed you how to create a game, yet simple enough that you could get through it without too many headaches. Please let me know your feedback in the comments down below, and I look forward to seeing you in another YouTube video. Don't forget to check out ProgrammingExpert.io and Blockchain Expert, which will be in the link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in another one.